Welcome to Kaiser Watch with John Kaiser. I'm your host, Jim Goddard. Welcome back to the show, John. And what's coming up today? Uh, Jim, today we're going to talk about uh, what this uh, Silicon Valley Bank uh, crisis uh, means for the resource juniors and a couple developments in the uh, lithium space. So just how will the banking crisis affect the juniors? Well, this week was a pretty hairy week for the resource juniors. Uh, uh, value traded has uh, shrunk significantly. Uh, when you start seeing bank stocks, which are supposed to be the boring, secure part of your uh, equity portfolio, tanking 15, 20 percent, and in the case of the Silicon Valley Bank, it's basically it was halted before it could go to zero. But the equity shareholders have effectively been wiped out. They're going to get zero after the uh, the Federal Reserve moved in on last Friday to take control of the bank and prevent a, uh, a, a bank run from completely emptying it. Now, now since then, um, there's two things that are uh, uh, sort of bothering the market. One is the, the Silicon Valley bank situation was an unusual situation in that it was the preferred bank for these countless startups on the West Coast that have been uh, backed by all these uh, venture capitalists. Many of these are uh, private startups that achieved a unicorn status, which means billion dollar plus valuation based on the on, on the, the last financing round. But last year, the tech su- sector bubble popped, and it's been very difficult to raise additional money. Now, all these startups, they've raised tens, hundreds of millions of dollars that they're burning through, advancing whatever their concept's going to be. Uh, there seem to be a lot of fintech-type companies uh, doing something or other with crypto. Uh, having them fail is probably not a bad thing, but there's also all kinds of other startups, and human capital is a key part of these ventures. So these companies all have big payrolls. They're paying all these uh, employees, uh, which are brain trusts. And what started to happen was... Uh, There was a de facto run on the Silicon Valley Bank as a result of these startups drawing down their cash balances to uh, pay for their payroll. And it wasn't being replenished because uh, uh, when when, when interest rates, risk-free interest rates are half half a percent uh, or so, um, well, then you could justify a 200 uh, for one PE ratio. But when they're at 4%, that drops to 25 for one. So there's been a freeze of interest in funding these private startups. And this says the uh, venture capitalists are uh, all, all pretty worried. They've all got their favorites that they're backing. And, and they were watching this uh, outflow of money. And the problem with the Silicon Valley Bank, they took all that money and parked it into bonds at very low rates back in 2020, 2021. And in 2022, when they started to rise, those uh, assets, their value declined significantly because uh, Jerome Powell has cranked the interest rates up to the four four percent, and uh, and and of course the uh, deposits, they're all real. They're supposed to be paid back at face value. So not only do you have your regular uh, depositors who have their money in savings deposits, but you have this extraordinary large money in there that's risk capital that the startups have raised that are going into this ecosystem of uh, you know venture capital on, on, the, on the West Coast. And all of a sudden, all these companies are being whispered to by their venture capitalist backers that uh, there's a potential problem with the Silicon Valley Bank because the uh, the value of the uh, the assets that your, your money was put into has shrunk, and the uh, money that you've put in there is also is also being pulled out, and uh, they need to sell this stuff to cover these deposits. So there began this sort of stealth withdrawal that basically turned into a bank run early last week when some of the venture capitalists uh, pulled the plug and just told it, get your money out of there fast. And of course, that made it official, and the Federal Reserve had to step in. And because this isn't just a bunch of people with, uh, you know, maybe more than 250000 that's guaranteed in there, and, and they have some extra in there that they might lose, uh, but all the rest of their capital is in brokerage firm accounts with, uh, in, in mutual funds or, or treasury bills directly, and those holdings would not be affected. Uh, it was these other entities, all these uh, startups, which if, they, if the money is gone, they're bust. And if they don't make payroll, 
they lose their employees. And the employees are already watching their options and RSUs declining because some of these startups are raising money, but it's no longer at, the, at a higher price than the last round. It's actually at a lower price. So they're seeing the valuation come down. So when, when one of these startups loses their, their capital, they're gone. Everybody's dispersed. So the, the Federal Reserve uh, was looking at the destruction of this huge community on the West Coast that was employing all these people. And to suddenly watch this evaporate, they decide to step in and basically guarantee these accounts and keep this thing from uh, totally, totally evaporating. And, and that's not the same situation everywhere. It is a consequence of over-concentration of a particular type of client in the Silicon Valley Bank, which happened over the last three decades because this bank did cater to the special needs of startups. But what all the media coverage did with this was highlight to the public this problem that the banks are, have put their, the, the, the customer savings deposits into these uh, government bonds whose value has declined. And so everybody is suddenly aware of a problem that only the most sophisticated uh, investors really understood was lurking in the background. And this has now started a bank runs all over the place. And uh, the, um, you know, the, the Federal Reserve is trying to contain this, uh, create calm. It's spread overseas to Europe, where they're very unhappy that the government uh, appeared to guarantee uh, all deposits for everybody, when in fact they just did it for the Silicon Valley Bank, which was a, a special situation. And Powell, of course, is still facing uh, 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 inflation. Uh, it's still at 6%, down from 6.4% year over year, but it's still there. He needs to raise interest rates higher to, to subdue it. But now you have this problem. Everybody understands that the higher interest rates go, the lower the value of all these uh, uh, bond assets of the banks go, and the bigger the risk is that uh, you might end up uh, uh, out of business. And for, for ordinary customers, yeah, you, you don't keep more than two fifty thousand in, in a bank account. You keep the rest of your wealth in in instruments that you own directly that aren't affected by the uh, entity who is a custodian for them. But for businesses which uh, have to have large amounts of cash present uh, to meet payroll and the ongoing expenses of business, this is a potential nightmare. So this has to be stabilized, and everybody's now thinking again. Okay, we're even if they don't increase interest rates, we're probably heading into some sort of recession that can't be positive for resource juniors because a recession means the metal prices are going to go down as demand decreases. So we kind of had a pause in the resource junior sector this week. But as people pull money out of their uh, these, these bank accounts, uh, where are they putting it? Well, when, when, the, when, the, when the crypto sector realized that the, all those fintech deals had been bailed out uh, to the Silicon Valley bank rescue, uh, Bitcoin, which was down below 20,000, actually jumped up over 20% as people uh, mistakenly think, well, you know, nobody owns Bitcoin. Uh, I have my Bitcoin. I pay whatever it is, and it's going to be there until the end of time. But Bitcoin itself is a Ponzi scheme, and it's... Uh, it requires energy to keep it going. And your Bitcoin could be down substantially tomorrow simply because people decide they don't want to be in it. So for now, it's benefiting more than gold has. But gold is the potential big beneficiary. It's knocking on the door of $2,000. Uh, gold is a physical substance that is, in effect, stored energy. It's not an energy liability like the like, like the blockchain that keeps Bitcoin alive. Uh, you, you've, you, you, once you've mined gold and concentrated into a gold bar, that energy is stored, and the gold bar isn't going anywhere if you have physical possession of it, or at least it's in the, in the, in the possession of a trustee that, uh, that can be trusted. So we're not looking at a situation where the combination of Author authoritarian central banks uh, trying to uh, shift away from uh, a weaponized U.S. dollar, uh, starting to buy more gold for their central central bank holdings, combining now with the general public thinking, I really do need to own more gold to ride out the shit show that's unfolding in the uh, in the banking sector right now, where we don't know what's going to happen, and. I think this will help gold finally breach $2,000 and turn $2,000 as the base 
for a trading range between 2,000 and 3,000. Now, now, since 2020, when they introduced all this extra quantitative easing to deal with, with COVID, uh, uh, gold charged through $2,000, but it has since settled back, and it's been bouncing in that 1,700 to 1,900 range. And the optics of those numbers are not the same as if it breaches $2,000, because part of the problem from the last few years is we have seen significant, you know, six to eight percent inflation according to the CPI, but in the resource mining sector, the inflation of capex and opex has been a lot higher. So the um, profitability of uh, mining gold and other metals uh, that has actually gone down despite the elevated prices uh, for gold. But if gold charges into 2000, gets to 2200, 2300, and then that becomes the new range, that will have overshot whatever the inflation uh, effects have been on the cost structure of mining gold. That will be a big boost for the uh, resource juniors uh, who are looking for gold. But we also have the, uh, the other, the non-resource metals. Even if we have a slowdown in the sort of macroeconomic demand for copper, nickel, and all that, as a result of uh, you know, a hard landing that seems to be inevitable for the economy. There are two forces at work which say that uh, uh, this won't matter because first we have the geopolitical problem that uh, 40% of most of the metals is concentrated or comes from China and Russia combined. And both of these now are on the autocracy side of what appears to be a fragmenting uh, global economy into separate trading zones, and it hasn't yet happened. But if it does, then the United States, Europe, and all its allies, they have a serious metal supply problem. They're going to have to get it from somewhere else, and that's going to have to be from their own shores, where the costs are going to be higher because they actually do care about the environment and the, and the health and welfare of, uh, of workers and so on. So that means whatever new supply comes, it's going to have a higher cost structure that puts it at a comparative disadvantage to these autocracies where the downstream victims of um, you know, bad environmental practice, and that, they have no say because that's what an autocracy is all about. And in addition to this geopolitical supply disruption risk, there is the issue that the, the energy transition, as far as electric vehicles are concerned, the car makers have gone beyond the point of no return. They are committed to adapting to the electric vehicle deployment and, and even trying to meet the, uh, the, the net zero emission goals by 2030. And whether or not they do, uh, there are substantial additional supply requirements for copper, lithium, nickel, and rare earths to make this reality. This is on top of the macroeconomic demand, which uh, will rebound after whatever recession we have to endure. So this is new metal supply that has to be developed. And if it has to be developed in jurisdictions that aren't China and, and Russia and the parts of Africa that Russia and China control, uh, that's going to be done by the juniors because the big companies, they are all caught with a, an inertia and the need for only big giant deposits. Uh, to, to be developed. So it's up to this collective of many, many juniors getting risk capital, looking, exploring for these deposits, uh, and the best ones will be grabbed by the majors and developed. And in the last couple of days, even though the market was down again today, the general equity market, we saw a brightening in the, uh, in the resource juniors. And it may be that the, that the market's realizing that even if everything else is going to be a, a terrible place to have your money in, the resource junior sector with uh, gold uh, breaching 2000, establishing a new visible trading range that uh, pleases people, and all these other geopolitical supply problems and energy transition, new required supply problems becoming very visible to everybody, we are set to see risk capital flow into this juniors and still have a fantastic bull market, even while the rest of the market uh, performs very poorly. What's next for Patriot battery metals? Well, what, Patriot was halted uh, Tuesday morning for a financing, which turns out to be a $50 million charity flow-through financing organized by Pear Tree, and it did not resume trading until Thursday. So for two days, while all hell was breaking loose in the market, uh, all these uh, Patriot battery shareholders were sitting there, oh boy, what's going to happen? Is this financing even going to close? 
Well, it did close because uh, the Australian side took the post flow through tax benefit uh, shares and basically uh, bought them all for like two 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 million two hundred fifteen thousand uh, shares at twenty two fifty seven. That was what it was uh, for the flow through. But when it was multiplied by 10 to for these uh, chest depository interests in Australia. They, they like to split stocks 10 for 1 because they're used to having a gazillion shares out, uh, uh, whereas uh, in, in North America, we actually tend to roll them back 10 for 1. So, for example, Piedmont Lithium trades at, at 10 times uh, the number of shares actually out, out in, in, in Australia. So they bought all this stock at a dollar 20 australian which when you adjust uh, you have to multiply that by 10 to get the the canadian uh, tsx venture trade equivalent so that's 12 dollars australian and because the australian dollar is worth uh, or the canadian dollars uh, australian dollars worth only 91 cents of a canadian dollar in fact it's like a lousier exchange rate than canada uh the the 11th the, the price of it though ends up being uh, so just under $11. So the hit that the uh, the market took when it was finally priced and the uh, flow-through component sold to the Australians, uh, they saw, oh, a stock that was sort of $14, $15 during PDAC week, now we got a nice 15% discount. And one of the pains of the last year has been that anytime there's a bot deal, it's done at a discount to the market. Existing shareholders get a 15 to 20% haircut. Uh, financing gets done. Yes, the com- company is replenished. It's in great shape to, to continue forward. But the stock price never bounces back to where it, where it was. So this is what has happened with Patriot Battery. It's now in that sort of 11 to $12 a Canadian range. That's down from where it was before. But it has 60 to $70 million dollars working capital, and uh, that gives it more than enough to finish delineating the uh, CV5 resource. They expect to have a maiden resource estimate out by, by the end of, end of June, and carry on with uh, uh, economic studies, more detailed drilling to, to push this towards a uh, develop, development situation. But the stock is kind of stuck right now because there's also the problem of t- almost 27 million warrants at 75 since that mostly expire at the end of this year. Um, those warrant holders are sitting on about $280 million of paper profits, and to collect that, they would need to exercise their warrants and sell the stock. So the, with the, the two-day wait that uh, during which everybody was terrified that, oh, are we going into this, this global uh, uh, crisis that's going to tank the economy and the markets and we'll watch my uh, Patriot battery metal profits uh, vanish. There is no fear in the hearts of those places. So I think the uh, Patriot battery metal market will be under pressure over the next while as people move to exercise the warrants. And apparently a fair number of them have already been exercised in the past couple of months, but there's still, uh, along with the, the $4 million at $0.25 cents that expire at, at the end of June, there is a significant overhang, warrant overhang, that is being liquidated right now. Now, will this hurt that Patriot battery metal? Well, I think one needs to also look at the Australian buyers of this financing. Now, now uh, about a month ago or so, we heard rumors that mineral resources, which is a sort of $14, $16 billion market cap uh, lithium producer, uh, was buying uh, Patriot Battery in the open market. Uh, None of that was ever confirmed, so we don't know. Nobody has come out as a 10% uh, or higher shareholder, so we don't know what these potential future owners of Patriot Battery Metals uh, own in the company. But I have heard that Both Pilbara Minerals, which is similar to mineral resources and mineral resources, both participated in this financing. So this wasn't just a bunch of Australian punters taking down this uh, $22 million uh, worth of of, of stock, uh, which was actually $50 million after the flow-through benefit was was, was stripped out. Uh, There were some potential future bidders for the company. So I don't think we'll see... Patriot battery metal spiral into, into, into a very low price because there seems to be a, a strategic appetite for the stock. And it really will be surprising if Patriot battery metals um, 
uh, is still around at the at the end of this year. Now, while I was updating my um, uh, Kaiser Research profile for Patriot Battery Metal, I was looking at the uh, 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 balance sheet for December 31st, and it looks like the company uh, has about um, uh, 20 has 21 million in current assets, but it's showing current liabilities of 10 10 and a half million dollars, and. Uh, a standard metric in the junior resource sector to assess the financial health is to subtract uh, uh, current liabilities from uh, current assets. Now, in current assets, uh, those get split between cash equivalents and a whole bunch of other stuff, and most of the other stuff is money that's already spent or, or not truly liquid. So you do look at the cash equivalent component as the most important component. But in the case of Patriot's uh, uh, balance sheet, most of that money is in the cash equivalent category. But the working capital uh, calculations suggest that they really only had 10.6 million working capital at the end of end, end, end of this uh, past year. And then I noticed a peculiar line item, which I had seen with another company recently and puzzled about it. Under current liabilities, there's something called flow-through premium liabilities carried at about $8.6 million. And I said, what on earth is this? This looks like an accounting fiction. And in fact, it is. A rule has just been uh, uh, proclaimed where companies, when they do a flow-through financing, have to uh, include a liability under current liabilities reflecting the flow-through premium, which they would be liable for if for some reason they don't spend the money as required. So, so now there's a system in place where Canada Revenue Agency audits the spending of flow-through money because, of course, uh, ordinary residents, Canadian residents, have collected the flow-through benefit and paid less tax as a consequence. And the whole purpose of flow-through is to encourage expiration expenditure in Canadian properties. But there's been cases where some companies, these lifestyle kind that uh, really aren't in the business of creating new wealth, they've managed to spend the money on something else, and suddenly uh, they get audited, and then the flow-through investors get denied their, their, their tax benefits, and suddenly they're in trouble and have penalties, and so they want to sue the, the company. Of course, the company, when it's run by grifters, is, it's got zero and just gets rolled back or delisted or whatever, and everybody disappears. So they've decided, we're going to put a stop to this. We're going to force these companies to disclose this flow-through reliability until an audit confirms that it has vanished. Okay, I think, well, well, that's fine. But the problem is it means that the working capital figures for legitimate companies will actually understate the financial health of the companies because in this case it will include a, almost a $9 million fictitious liability. And we know that Patriot Battery is going to spend the flow-through money on its Corvette expiration. That's not going to waste it on pump and dump uh, uh, newsletter schemes or things like that or, or, or for, for, for acquiring worthless assets from, from uh, secret insiders. No, th this is a real company. And if you follow real companies, uh, there really isn't any concern that the flow-through money won't be spent properly and that the company will suddenly be liable for a huge amount of money, which nobody will want to fix so the company dies on you. It's not really a problem if you avoid the, the lifestyle grifter companies, but it means you're going to have to be careful when you look at the balance sheet to watch for these flow-through premium liabilities under current assets because these do not really e exist. You're going to have to strip those out and calculate your working capital as if that isn't there. What is the status of the Eagle Plains royalty spin-out? Uh, Eagle Plains uh, created confusion earlier this week when they put out an update saying that March 17th was going to be the day of record without making it clear what it was the day of record for. And so uh, some, some shareholders uh, or investors uh, jumped to the conclusion that, uh, oh, this is the day of record for the spin-out, which means that with two-day settlement, uh, March 15th, Wednesday, would have been the last day to buy the stock and still get the royalty spin-out. And Eagle Plain shareholders will be getting a one a royalty portfolio share for every three Eagle Plains shares. On Thursday, very early in the morning, the company put out an emergency news release saying the day of record refers to the 
special meeting that will be held on April 26th to approve the spin-out. And even though the company has gone to great lengths to uh, uh, consult all its shareholders to make sure they're all on side with this thing, it's pretty confident um, uh, that the, the, uh, the spin-out will be approved. You never know until the vote actually happens. So you can't really declare a day of record for a dividend in species spin-out until you have the approval to do so, and that will happen after April 26. So the company has come out and said, no, this is for this day of record is for being able to vote for or against the spin-out at the April 26th meeting. So the good news for everybody is when you're buying Eagle Plains, uh, you're, you're, you're still getting the royalty spin-out. The company averted a potential disaster where they had not clarified and people assumed that it was ex-dividend on, on Thursday, March 16th. They may have dumped the stock thinking that, okay, it's going to retreat somewhat uh, to reflect the spin-out of this asset. And then they would have discovered that they, that they sold the company, knocked the price down, and the, the, the uh, royalty was still part of it. So they got this out just in time, clarified. And Eagle Plains, uh, it, it's part of my favorites collection. It's up about 50% from the start of the year. And that reflects, uh, to some degree, the uh, realization that this royalty spin, now it's going to be worth at least $0.10 cents per share, and then probably start rising, rising after the, uh, the spin-out company fin finally goes public. But the company has also gotten a boost from uh, uh, an announcement on March 2nd that they had staked six lithium pegmatite prospects. And, of course, Eagle Plains is a prospect generator farm type company that scours the archives and looks for claims where past work has been done that have become open. And uh, I guess they finally picked up on all the lithium buzz, and, uh, and Tim Tremondi's team went to work, and they staked two in British Columbia and four in Saskatchewan. They have not disclosed the locations because apparently they are not done. Uh, since this is all map staking, sophisticated competitors can see who is doing what where, though it may be difficult when they use uh, numbered companies or something else to make it unclear who is staking, staking what where. But uh, definitely in the case of Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan starting to heat up as a, as a potential lithium pegmatite region. Um, in, in late January, Searchlight Resources, which had managed to scoop the uh, Jan Lake pegmatite field next to its Hanson Lake field, uh, it ended up farming out 100% uh, of both to Brunswick Ex Exploration, which is going to be drilling at least on the Hanson Lake pegmatites by, uh, by, by June or July of, of this year. And they got a lot of negative feedback uh, from, from shareholders, like, how come you gave away this, this lithium, these lithium claims in Saskatchewan? And, and Stephen Wallace uh, sort of rolled up his sleeve and says, well, I, I, I am a, 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 on an equal, if not superior, par with uh, Tim Termundi's team and going through archives. And on, on February 27th, Searchlight uh, Resources announced that they had staked seven prospects in Saskatchewan. One of them, Davin Lake, is a 27,000 hectare land claim. And they also have not made public uh, where these are located because groups like that who understand how to research the archives, understand what to look for, Eagle Plains, Searchlight, they're all now going through Saskatchewan's uh, archives and picking off these regions that have pegmatite potential. So while Quebec, James Bay, gets all the attention right now in terms of lithium potential, and justifiably so. Ontario and Ontario have gotten a lot of attention. Saskatchewan, which uh, even their own, uh, uh, you know, geological survey uh, people have been kind of dismissive about the pegmatite potential. That has really only been because pegmatite, lithium pegmatites, have never been a meaningful economic target, and now Saskatchewan's potential is being rethought. So. Eagle Plains, I, I'm sure we're going to hear more. Searchlight will hear more. But right now, everybody's in stealth mode, so we don't know where these claims are. But stay tuned. We're going to see more. And in the case of uh, Eagle Plains, this company has 10 million working capital. And by June, we'll be drilling the Vulcan uh, uh, Sullivan II type CDEX play in southern British Columbia. Uh, Eagle Plains is the one that has the most obvious reason to keep trending up. Searchlight continues to be a bottom fish to be accumulated at its current price of $0.04. Cents. Uh, are the market still ignoring it? Probably because there are these $0.05 cent warrants that expire in, in September, and it may not get far beyond that. But again, this is creating an opportunity to 
to build a bottom fish position in a company that's building up meaningful lithium pegmatite exposure in Saskatchewan. John, thank you so much for the update. You're welcome, Jim. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on Kaiser Watch are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as a recommendation to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at kaiserresearch.com.